Hey guys, this is Dodoid. So normally when I make a video about one of my SGIs, I go really in depth about its history, its specifications, its software. This is not one of those videos. Uh, in this video, we're just taking a simple look at the internals of the SGI Indie by taking it apart. There may be a more in-depth Indie video in the future, though my Indie is not the highest priority of my SGIs to get going. But um, I thought we'd just take a look inside this machine, maybe show you some of the parts inside, and um, start with showing you how to open this, because that's something that some people will actually have trouble with. So first off, there's absolutely no shame in not knowing how to open an indie. In fact, you can see the screwdriver marks from where I was trying to pry it open when I first got this thing. Um, basically, to open this, and this took me a long time to figure out, you take your finger, you press on this black thing. Now, a lot of people think that the black thing is going to pull out, and it's going to be some sort of a latch that opens it. It doesn't do that. You just hold the black thing, and you use it to support your fingers while you lift up on the blue, and if you push really strongly, you actually bend the whole plastic at the top up and slide it forwards and the indie is open. Then you can take the front and lift it and slide it off, and there's the internals. So let's start from this side. Over here we have the power supply. Now, some indies have Nidex power supplies, and others have Sony power supplies. This is a Nidex supply, which are known for going bad. Only one of my indies has a power supply, the other one doesn't. So I'm guessing that when either of them died, the other one lost its power supply as a spare. Now, um, over here, you can see the RAM. This is the same sort of RAM stick that's used in the Indigo 2. Uh, they go into these, there's eight slots, there, and the RAM has to be installed in sets of four. So you can see there's four sticks here. I couldn't take one out, I couldn't take two out, they have to be in fours. So you either have four or eight sticks in an Indy. Um, the RAM is obviously connected to the motherboard, which is down here. Uh, it's a bit hard to see, because there's a lot of things on top of it. But uh, this is an IP22 design, which is very, very similar to the Indigo 2, though the actual physical layout of the board is different. Um, it is still very similar in terms of the way it technically works. Uh, so as I said, this is an IP22 system. Uh, interestingly, the power supply has only two connectors. One that seemingly carries power, and the other that seemingly carries the button signals from the front, and presumably the audio for the speaker, because for some reason, on the Indy, the speaker is part of the power supply. Uh, so that plugs in here, and Interestingly, the motherboard actually carries the power for the drive through it. So if we lift the SCSI cable back, you can see the power adapters are here. They plug into the motherboard, so there's no big messy cable going over there. It's just right from the board. Now, normally there'd be a bit of a drive cage here. Unfortunately, neither of my indies have them. I got them from the same person, and um, both indies just sort of have a bit of foam that I'm presuming the drive sat on when there was a drive in here. Uh, I also don't have any of the SCSI drives that use this sort of a plug on them, so I am looking for one of those. That's why I say the indie isn't quite running right now. Um, that's where the drive would be. There isn't one in there. And you can also have a floptical drive on top, which can hold up to 20-odd megabytes. It's like an optical version of the floppy. Over here, we have the R4000 CPU. So like in most SGIs, this is on a module that plugs into the board. And uh, this is just the uh, same sort of R4000 that you'd see in other SGIs. The Indy also came with an R4400, R4600, and an R5000. I actually don't know whether this is the 4000, 4400, or 4600, but I'm pretty sure it's not the 5000. Uh, anyway, moving on from this, there's this. Now this brown board with factory installed bodge wires is probably the main reason that the Indy is nicknamed an Indigo without the Go. Um, basically, this graphics board is extremely simplistic. It doesn't do 3D, uh, it has only one display output, and it can't even do more than 256 colors. Uh, this is the low-end graphics, the Newport. You can also get XZ graphics for the Indy, which would do uh, 3D, but it was still rather simplistic compared to the better options in the Indigo and Onyx at the time. So, um, really simplistic graphics on my model at least, and the, the XZ was a little better. Interestingly, if you use XZ graphics with an R5000, the R5000 is actually so overpowered for the graphics that it actually takes over graphics duty and does the rendering on the CPU, because even though it's having to do it in software, it's actually faster thanks to the R5000. With an R4000, you just use the, um, the actual graphics accelerator on the board. Um, so there's one last thing I wanted to show in here, and this is this, this chip here. 
So this is the Dallas chip, as most people call it. You can see there's a drawing of a dog on it. And basically, this is a chip and a battery in one. So once the battery in here dies, the ND can start to have problems because it can no longer store its PROM data. But if you do have an ND that's going a bit weird, you can look up online what the problems that this going bad will cause are. You might just be able to switch this and have a perfectly good ND again. So don't toss it out if this thing's going bad, you can switch them. So that was just a quick look at the internals of the SGI ND. Uh, thanks for watching, bye.